So yeah, I guess um, at that time I thought being with a white person would be easier for me. A white person who is culturally open and interested in my culture. Um, in terms of that, that I would be more liberated sexually and could express myself and, and, and not to be judged in my, you know, my choices and my, in my femininity and my, in my gender, which was of course not the case, but I guess that was what I believed in at that time. We all the time have this tendency in Sudan even to think light skin Sudanese are more wanted. One example that I maybe always mentioned is that I grew up to TV ads saying that become more white, become more clean. And this is a refrain that we have in Spanish. In Mexico we say, um, Tu tienes que mejorar la raza, and it means like you have to um, improve your race when you find a couple or and you have kids. And is there like was there a situation when you got hurt because it was beauty wise standard? Yes. <laughs> yes. Every day since I was eleven. Um um, okay, I remember I was like 13 or 12 or something and we were making a doll out of papier mache uh, during high school in one of the classes and it was a human and she was white because people, they like her skin color was like really light pink or something and I started making the nipples and uh, I started taking brown because <laughs> my nipples are brown, you know, and then I started coloring the nipples and everyone started like making fun of me and like laughing at me and also in a very kind of uh, in a degrading way, you know, laughing like, oh my god, ew, that's disgusting. Why are you taking brown? And I was like, that was, I was like 12 or 13. It was the first time I realized, oh my god, white people have pink nipples. What the hell? That's insane. I didn't, I never like thought about that. The way that I looked was seen as weird or different or even disgusting, you know, um, compared to how white people looked. As a girl, as a young girl, uh, as a teenager, I was so insecure. Like, I was so insecure about how I looked, about my arm hair, about my big, beautiful nose that I did not find beautiful <laughs> back then. Um, because all I saw in media was white people being pretty and yeah i think that at some point it even went got to a point where i got so insecure that i dyed my hair blonde and i put on blue contacts and this is something that many many brown girls do you know like so many wear like lighter you know contact lenses or dye their hair you know different like lighter colors to fit in or to look more white um yeah i did that Uh, and then I went to high school, um, and it was a the, it was a high like the highest education level. So I was only surrounded by white people mm -hmm. that were upper class, middle upper class, and I got very whitewashed. <laughs> so that was the time that I started falling for um, guys that were like white boys with Tommy Hilfiger and just you know or that play hockey, mm -hmm. um, and. I got over, like, I think I was always more attracted to brown men, but it was more of a status thing, I think, more of a status thing, more of a this is what you should fall for, because this is what all the other girls find attractive, the blonde guy, you know, mm -hmm. so I forced myself, I think, almost, in a way, uh, subconsciously, because of insecurities and wanting to fit in and all these things, to also find that type of guys attractive. you get into this identity, I got into this identity crisis, basically of, you know, who am I, who am I not? But when you're a teenager, you just want to fit in, you know, it's a thing, you just want to be a part of something and find the community, and my only access to that was 
very, very white people. Um, and I started adapting. I started adapting to how they were, and that meant that I <clears throat> gave up on, you know, a lot of what I was. It took me, it took me um, a fair 24, 23 years to realize how uh, unhealthy it was to always adapt to other people. We need to really talk about this and have conversations like we're having now because I don't want other 12 year or 13 year old girls to hate themselves the way they look because of the fucked up world that we live in basically. Um, but it's, I'm, I, for, I think for me, I've, I'm at a point where it's no longer hurting me. Okay. Like I'm, I consider myself a pretty beautiful woman. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> I'm over it by now. But yeah, it was a long journey. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I definitely can tell you that 99% of the people I know in my life decided to, like, did stuff to look more white. There is the common narrative of when you are buying a suit, you have to wear darker stuff because it makes you look more white. That's like a common sentence that's always being said in Egypt or things like, Oh, maybe I should use this cream from the TV and look more white because that, that would make me look more uh, attractive to, to, to people, right? I really think that in my subconscious I grew up to always wanting to be white even though I never dared to tell that to myself until like, I don't know, a couple of years ago when I started to realize like, why am I trying to be more white? Because whiteness is not just a skin color, let's, let's be honest, like whiteness is something that is a bigger issue. So, for example, to, to, to see Egyptians putting English language in, in their daily usage of, of, of Arabic, right? Like, you are speaking to Arabic people, including myself, I always throw English words in the middle. A common thing about the, the template of people in Egypt that I told you that they don't want to be conceived as mainstream is the concept of I only listen to English music and I only watch English movies. I would never listen to this shit from Egypt, right? Yeah, I think, I think that there are so many things that Egyptians do just to look more white and I'm not just talking about the physical appearance but just to act more white, like to inherit everything from the West world. Yeah, I think as a typical Egyptian teenager, mm -hmm. I think I was always attracted to this super white woman, probably has to be slightly conservatively dressed, you know, there is this stereotype type of, of a woman that you should marry and that's super cute and you know, she's like a, usually wearing a hijab, of course, because I was religious at that time, and then she's like super white, she has to be super white because if she's dark skinned, that's like that's ugly, that's equated to ugly in, in, in the lingo of Egypt, right? And I, like, in, it's uh, in the subconscious, right? Like, this is something I never thought about before moving to Europe. Now, but then when I moved, I was like, why on earth I never dated a darker skinned girl? Like, it never happened. It just simply never happened. It started to happen with immigration for me. Once I moved abroad, I started to see I'm losing privileges. And then why on earth are those white people not believing me when I'm saying that something is wrong? And that was when I started to realize more and more what's happening in Egypt. And I was like, what? This is exactly what the Egyptian women were saying to me for the last like seven, eight years and I didn't understand. Moving to Europe, like I think in one day I started to just call myself black because that was like it, like people don't see that difference at all. So yeah, I, I would put myself on the black side of things. And I don't, again, this is also a bit wrong from my side, right? Because I'm even taking over the, like I'm claiming for myself, like being a victim even more than black people, which is, I'm pretty sure is not true. 
but at least many white Europeans treat me as a black person, right? They they just call me black. They just they they react on that. And like, if you are whiter, you can approach stranger much easy. Uh, stranger is strangers much easier, right? And in fact, actually in Budapest, one of the again back to the bouncer and the, at the club door, like a guy this time said it explicitly. He said like, okay, sorry, you are not white to enter here. And then. The fact is that that guy was a person of color himself, right? Like that was even like more shocking a bit for me. I was like, man, what are what are you saying? Like this is just super weird. And he's like, yeah, well, that's what they said. Like, only white people can enter here. It happened once that I dated a girl for for one date, and then we were supposed to go out for the second, and then she apologized and then later on like I don't know a month later we met and then she said something like listen I was super interested but I had this talk with a friend of mine and then she started to scare me a bit because she was like come on he's an Arab he's brown look at his Facebook look at the problems he has in his life and what is he interested in and look at what you're interested in this is a topic that she never mentioned but sometimes I feel from some of her friends Right, like this is kind of obvious. Like there are some of her friends that even started to be less friends with her since we are together. And I, she questions herself, what have I done? But and this is one of the things I would never mention to her because I know she wouldn't understand. But in my head, I'm like, I know why. I just know that these people wouldn't like to be around her because she's with me at the moment. Tell me about your first crush. Do you remember your first crush? My first crush? I think it was all of the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> so they were my first crushes. And then it was Aaron Carter, who was the brother of one of the Backstreet Boys. And then pretty much every guy in my school who looked like him. So I don't really remember the person. Being born and raised in, in a Western society, in a Western culture, but on the other hand, belonging to a different world as well. I'm a mix of two different countries, um, two Orient countries. My, my father is Persian, my mom is Palestinian, but then being born and raised in Germany put me into an identity crisis. So you're never really fully accepted by the German society, but you're also never fully accepted by your own society because you're too Western. My parents, they were trying everything to integrate us into this German society. They, my, my dad is an atheist, but they would go with us to church. Well, there's, we have nothing to do with Christianity. They would bring us to all the events where uh, the other parents would see us and see that we're integrated. They would never, my mom would never speak to us about Islam. Um, just when I got older, I had questions and this is when I was able to learn about it. Uh, they would, uh, actually they would never really talk about our skin color because they never wanted us to make, to feel different, but they would always tell us, you know, uh, you don't have to speak uh, Farsi or Arabic in front of the other children, you know, just you can do it at home, we don't want you to get in trouble. So they were actually afraid. My parents were really afraid that we would get into more circles of violence and they would change my brother's name. My brother had, you know, my brother's name would be Yunus, which is a beautiful Arabic, uh, Hebrew name, you could say. And they would change it into Jonas, which is the German version. So he would have less trouble as a man which didn't help at all because <laughs> he still looked like a Middle Eastern <laughs> boy and um, they would also give me a name which does not sound you know very Middle Eastern but uh, it wouldn't help us so that's how they would uh, try to handle the situation and I think it would have been better if they would have set us down and, and talked about that this is a racist society and yeah, they were trying to protect us as much as they could. I was 
um, not allowed to play with the children in kindergarten because they would tell me I cannot play with you because you're a foreigner. My mom wouldn't allow it and it was completely fine. When I had uh, blonde uh, Barbie dolls, I was trying to color the hair with uh, black pants or I would cut the hair. I had like a severe anger. Later in school, it was apparent through teachers, they would ask me questions like, hey, so um, Dahlia, can you tell the class how it is not to celebrate Christmas? And I would say, but we're celebrating Christmas. And they would be like, no, you're not, stop lying. So I would be picked out in the middle of the class and yeah, put on the spot. A lot of things like that, um, if I would uh, talk in class to, to fellow students or you do naughty things like all kids do, my teacher would say like, uh, Arab quick kids have to be quiet too, you know? I mean, always very racial remarks. Children would, uh, yeah, they would make remarks about uh, my, appear uh, my appearance, they would call me, you know, they would call me dirty Turk or you stupid Turkish kid. Um, it was always based on that, so yeah, it was pretty. <laughs> it was pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Actually, I actually as a kid already connected the dots mm -hmm. that yeah, there's a huge difference between me and other children. Being a Middle Eastern woman also kind of put a certain pressure on me. When I, when I grew up, when I became older, I was trapped, right? I was trapped between this longing for, for self-determination in terms of sex, but then I was also trapped in not belonging to the German society, to the Western society, and also not really wanting to to be honest. So yeah, I guess um, at that time I thought being with a white person would be easier for me, a white person who is culturally open and interested in my culture, um, in terms of that, that I would be more liberated sexually and could express myself and, and, and not to be judged in my, you know, my choices and my, in my femininity and my, in my gender which was of course not the case, but I guess that was what I believed in at that time. And I believe that um, the reason why many women think they feel attracted to the white men is because they feel like the chosen one, the chosen one in terms of Oh, I pick you out from your community and make you know, make you different. It would differentiate you from your own society, from your own community, which is also, you know, something that can cause internalized oppression because then you feel, hey, I'm, I'm the chosen one. I don't belong to that community. I belong to something that is seen more liberated. And then you start to see traits of your own culture as negative, which are in fact not negative in, re in reality. I was in a relationship for five years with a white man. And I realized that um, it was a very abusive relationship. And I, I realized that most of our fights and um, the structure of our relationship the foundation of it was, and it sounds might sound very crazy, but the foundation of it was really based on dominance, on, on racial dominance actually, on even colonization. And, and yeah, the, the hegemony of, of the white men came through. So when he wanted to, you know, you have a fight and you talk about something and, and uh, he would disagree with me, he wouldn't disagree with me as a person that I am. He would say, oh, you're so Persian. Why do you have to act so Persian? Or why do I have to act so Arab? Oh, this is your Muslim identity that makes you react that way to me now.
we don't know anymore if you know if if you have like yeah it, that we don't know anymore what's right and what's wrong if if it's ourself or if it's him or if it's our culture so i believe this was the moment when i realized that there's always a power structure a difference I think um, the issue is that from young age, you know, as a, as a German person of color, from young age, we're kind of oppressing our struggle, right? Because uh, everyone else is, you know, the white community is trying to suppress it by shutting us up. If we're trying to address an issue, they say, hey, come on, that's not racist. Why are you complaining about now? Why do you have to make everything complicated? So we're suppressing it. I think what's important is that the younger generation should actually be able to communicate their struggle from the beginning, to, to embrace their rage, to embrace their problems, to, to, to address them, to, to build a certain uh, communication also with the white community in order to, yeah, to build a common understanding. And when that happens, I think those faces that I went through could be, I wouldn't say avoid it, but maybe they could be easier for them because they would be more aware of what is actually happening. But as long as we are oppressed, as long as our voices are oppressed and our struggle is demeaned, we will go through phases like that because it will hit us like a brick, right? And we're going to internalize our oppression also. Okay.